Now that Oregon football has added Noah Whittington, what is the status of the Ducks running back room? Looking at that today, plus Kenny Dillingham, big on the RPO stuff. There's a particular reason I think that is good news for Oregon fans as we look ahead to our offense here in 2022. I'm all sorts of fired up recording this in the middle of the first day of March Madness. Plenty of energy coming your way here on Locked on Ducks. Here we go. You are Locked on Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster and lifelong Oregon Ducks fan. It's part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Thank you for making this your first listen or your first view every single day right here on your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks every single day. Like and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Those subscription numbers, they are approaching 100, which is awesome. Thank you all so much. And wherever you're listening to the show, like and subscribe if you haven't already. Five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Would appreciate that if you like the show. Or if you think I'm a four-star host, I'm okay with that. Four-star, five-star, it's all good. As long as you're being positive in there, we like to see that. Nice comments. I appreciate those as well. If you ever want a question answered right here on the show, tweet with the hashtag AskLODPod, or you can DM my personal account. You see it down there at smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks. Make sure you're following along with the show. You can DM that account as well. If you want to comment on YouTube, push back on a take I have in there. Always open to that sort of stuff as long as you're being polite, which people on the whole are. And I appreciate seeing all of that. So all sorts of energy today. I love March Madness. And yeah, it sucks that the Ducks are not in it. It's not fun. I wouldn't get used to it. That'll be a subject for a later pod in terms of a deep dive. But long story short, Dane Altman's not going to miss the tournament year in and year out. That's not a regular thing that he does. And I love March Madness, man. Oh, St. Peter's just beat Kentucky. That's when I'm recording this. And then Creighton came back, a 9-0 run to end the second half, get to overtime with San Diego State. Their star player and big man goes down. They win anyway. Electric. So that's why I've got an extra level of juice here today on the pot. So let's get to Oregon football. Noah Whittington, good-looking running back coming over from Western Kentucky, a former Hilltopper. I fully expect him to get carries this year the question is how many and where does he sort of fit into the running back room and how does it shape up at that position for the Ducks now in spring football with Jordan James still not there and he isn't there quite yet he should be soon and then coming up with uh, the fall season as well so that's uh, that's segment number one today let's get into it first let's examine the running back room as it currently stands here are the guys who we know will be playing running back for Oregon come 2022, and maybe they add other transfers, or maybe guys step up. Who knows? You, you never know what's going to happen between now and then, but this is where the running back room currently sits for Oregon in terms of career carries, and it is really not a lot at all. And that's a fascinating area to look at because just a couple months ago, hey, we were feeling good. Yeah, maybe Die and Verdell will both be back and Sean Dollars will be back healthy and Trey Benson is still in there. And then boom, 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 all gone from the program. Guys have to step up. And the guy we expect to step up, Byron Cardwell. In his career, 61 carries, 417 yards, three touchdowns, 6.8 yards per carry. Those are his stats from this past season. Did a really nice job filling into the backup running back role after C.J. Verdell went down with a leg injury through five games. And then Travis Dye became the number one. Cardwell was the number two, and I thought he looked really good. Had some nice runs against Colorado, the, a game ceiling touchdown, kind of, of an exclamation point. The Ducks were going to win anyway against Washington State. He showed some really nice patience, ability to move laterally, not a super physical runner, but a really nice looking running back prospect. So he's got the second most carries for the Ducks coming back. Sean Dollars has got 15 carries for 128 yards in his career. Now, that's the bad news is he's coming off of an injury. He didn't run the ball at all last year. But in the limited action we've seen, he's averaging eight and a half yards a carry. Now, it's only 15 touches, but that's that's got to make Duck fans feel pretty optimistic here in terms of his physical gifts. Noah Winnington, the guy coming in, 
101 carries a season ago. Talked about that on yesterday's pod. He ran for 617 yards, a couple touchdowns, including an 86-yarder in the Boca Raton Bowl against Appalachian State when he showcased the breakaway speed that he's got, and he has got a lot of it for a 200-pound running back. So he's got 101 carries in his career. And then Jordan James, who will be arriving in the next few weeks or so for spring football, the running back recruit that Dan Lanning flipped from the Georgia Bulldogs over to the Ducks, four-star prospect. Good-looking guy, does a lot of his damage between the tackles. He and Whittington actually have kind of similar builds, and I think they run in a similar way. But Jordan James, of course, zero college carries. So the most experienced running back that Oregon has is Noah Whittington, and he's never taken a carry against a Power 5 opponent. Now, Conference USA, we've all heard of it, right? We know it's a, a step or two below the Power Five conferences, though, with the way the Pac-12 has been in the last couple of years, there are questions about how big that step actually is. And that's, it's a strange place to be as Duck fans. It's an unfamiliar place. And I'll tell you exactly why. But first, I want to tell you about Built Bar. Have you tried the Puffs? If you haven't tried the Puffs, you're missing out on one of the best things that Built Bar makes. And they make fantastic Power Bar. I hadn't eaten a Power Bar before I had Built Bar Literally, it had been at least six years all through college. I never ate one. I never liked them. I didn't snack on them, didn't do anything. Built Bars have got me back on them. They're loaded up in my golf bag. They're covered in 100% real chocolate, puffs included. Go to built.com, scroll down to the macros chart. You'll be blown away. High protein, low calorie, high fiber, low carb, 17 grams of protein. Head to built.com, enter promo code block 15 for 15% off at built.com. Dot com and get your favorite flavor today. You know, mine is mint brownie. I love those mint brownie bars, but a bunch of other good ones as well, like cookies and cream. So head to belt.com, promo code LOCKED15. It's a strange place to be for Duck fans. Without this certainty about what the running back room is going to look like or what we can expect, we have half an idea about Byron Cardwell's capabilities and maybe a tenth of an idea about what Sean Dollars can do and a little bit of an idea of, of what Whittington is capable of, but that's not a lot of reassurance. And w- when you look at the overall carries distribution, the reason that I'm talking about all these different guys is especially at a position like running back, running back and receiver, you just see a lot of different names come through. Receiver maybe a little bit more so because you have three or four on the field at, at any given time, depending on the offensive package. But at running back, you see a lot of different bodies because it's just such a physical and and taxing position on your body. So you have to be able to rotate guys in and out. And just this past year, C.J. Verdell had 78 carries in five games. Travis Dye had 211. That was the most on the team. There was 151 for Anthony Brown. So most teams would actually have a, a running back who has their second most carries, but Oregon had with the quarterback because of the scheme they ran last year. And because the RPO is definitely going to come back, I expect whoever starts for Oregon, probably Bo Nix, but you never know, maybe Ty Thompson will take it. Both are going to be expected to use their legs within the scheme of this offense with Kenny Dillingham. We'll get to a little bit later in the show uh, once again. But 211 carries for Die, 151 for Anthony Brown, 78 for C.J. Verdell. 61 for Byron Cardwell Jr. and 14 carries for seven McGee, only a couple of which actually came out of the backfield. Most of those were on jet sweeps, and hopefully we see even more of that this upcoming year because he's just, I I love watching him in space. He's so quick. He accelerates so fast and can make guys miss in space. And he finishes runs too for a little guy. De'Anthony Thomas had that back in the day. If you watch some of his runs, when he would stretch to the sideline, De'Anthony would tend to scoot out of bounds. But when he was running between the tackles, He'd lower his shoulder from time to time, and it would surprise you because he's known as such a speed guy. Seven McGee reminds me of him in, in that way. Not quite the athlete that the that DeAnthony was, but who is? <laughs> I mean, really, I don't know if Oregon will ever have an athlete come through who runs in space and makes jukes like DeAnthony Thomas did. That guy was uh, fantastically awesome. So the bottom line here is not a lot of experience in the Oregon running back room. And yes, we saw Byron Cardwell get some extended carries from time to time, but never be the bell cow back, right? Because he's a true freshman a season ago. And so he hasn't had to carry the workload over the course of a season. Sometimes running backs wear down. Sometimes they accumulate injuries or just not quite as effective. They don't have that extra step by the end of the year if their bodies aren't trained for it. That's why it's good to have a number of running backs in the room who you feel confident in. And though there's 
Uh, some justification, I would say, for Duck fans to be a little uneasy about what we'll get from our running backs this year. There's also some cause for optimism. And remember, if you're one of those Duck fans out there who's saying, boy, it's not a lot of experience. Wish we had a guy who'd gone through a full season, you know, being a, a true number one running back because Whittington last year was in an air raid scheme. So only had 100 carries, half as many as as Travis Dye did. And Dye had way more touches in the passing game as well. So we've never had a true number one running back. Maybe it'll be just running back group by committee all season long. And we'll get to see what each of these guys can do in spurts. But the last time I remember Oregon being in this state of limbo was recent subject of uh, of the show here on Locked on Ducks, LeGarrette Blunt got suspended. And then we we're going, well, he was our number one guy. What are we going to do? It worked out all right. We found this guy from Texarkana. You might remember him. His name's Michael James. He turned out to have a pretty good career. And then uh, and the guy behind him ended up getting more carries, Kenyon Barnett. Yeah, he had a pretty good career too. So though it's a, it's a little bit a state of limbo right now for the Ducks at, at running back because you just don't have guys who have proven it over long stretches of time. Well, Michael hadn't proven anything until he did. And some guys just need an opportunity. And I look forward to all these guys getting the chance to, to compete and get carries and show what they're capable of because in their own way, they're all very talented. I mean, I mean, frankly, with Whittington, from what I've seen and the fact that he has that personal history with Carlos Lachlan, our running backs coach, I expect all three of the guys that are at the top, Byron Cardwell and Noah Whittington and Sean Dollars, to all compete. And I don't know that there is a set depth chart. Oregon is expecting, I think fans generally are expecting, and if you think I'm wrong, you shoot me a comment or a message or anything, but I think we've all kind of gotten our minds, oh yeah, Byron Cardwell is going to be our number one running back. Well, is he? I mean, it, he certainly could be. I would be fine with that. I would be 100% okay with Byron Cardwell being the number one. But each of these guys brings something unique to the table, and maybe it'll just be by committee kind of all season long and play the hot hand, which is something that a lot of teams do at the running back position. Cardwell, I think his biggest strength is his patience and acceleration making cuts, at least in the 61 carries that we've seen in his young career with the Ducks. Cardwell or excuse me, Sean Dollars, if he's healthy, is probably the most physically gifted of any of these guys. He was the highest rated coming out of high school, even higher rated than Cardwell was, though they were in a different class. Um, he was, uh, Sean Dollars, that is, one of the top running backs in the class of, of 2020. He's got really unique physical traits and his burst to the outside. I just always think of that one run in the Pac-12 championship game against USC. He showed a burst and an acceleration, but he's also got some size and a decent amount of strength to him. He could be the most physically gifted, whereas Whittington is the most experienced. So all of those traits are going to be in play for this offensive staff as they as they look to find a number one running back. And maybe one guy will emerge, or maybe it'll just be a little bit of give and take here and here and there. And it's something that we'll definitely monitor as, as spring football goes along. Yesterday on the show, I talked about Kenny Dillingham, our offensive coordinator, and how he'll do a lot of the same things based on what I've seen from the offenses he was a part of at Florida State and Memphis. This will be his first time being kind of the, the leader on the offensive side of the ball because he's always had Mike Norvell there as well. And so he'll be, you know, the play caller and he's the, the top offensive coach on the team. I think that's the best way to put it. It's the first time he's doing that. And though he'll do a lot of the same things that Joe Moorhead has done the last couple of years, which, as I talked about yesterday, I really like, there's a trend in there that Oregon fans should be happy about. I'll tell you what that is after I tell you that it's that time of year and college basketball's tournament is finally upon us. The upsets have been a brewing, and now they are ready to be served to the dinner party, and they are fantastic. Shout out to St. Peter's. Legends are born in March. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, betonline.net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. Bet Online remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. It's not just basketball. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. So Dillingham will do a lot of the same things that Joe Moorhead did. With, with the RPO, the quick hitting passes, make quick reads, get the ball out on the edge to guys in space around the line of scrimmage and let them go make plays. And I like that approach a lot. And the reason that I am encouraged by what I've seen from his offenses on film, again, we'll have to wait until the spring game and ultimately the fall 
to have a concrete idea of what the offense will be. This is just kind of the expectations based on past games and studying film, which I do take the time to do from time to time, uh, pretty often, actually. But here's the way that I was thinking about it. College football, in so many ways, is this grand, majestic, beautiful spectacle in our society because of its tradition. But the best teams are the ones that are able to evolve. And it's that way in the NFL and, you know, frankly, in, in basketball as well. They still have to be able to defend. I think that that's a little bit more ingrained in basketball than it is in football right now. Um, whereas in football, you can just go score a million points, right? I mean, think about this. Nick Saban is the best college football coach in the history of the sport. I don't think that's a hot take. He's, he's pretty good at this stuff. He used to make all his money just not that long ago, frankly, at the defensive end. Remember 2011, Vern Lundquist, Gary Danielson on the call. 9-6 was the final score. LSU won that game. Bama came back, beat him in the national championship. If I remember correctly, LSU didn't score in that game, or at least not until late in the fourth quarter. I mean, these were dominating defenses, and Saban comes from that side of the ball. But if you watched Alabama, in 2022, for the first time, you'd never seen them before, and you watched their team with Bryce Young and all these receivers they've had coming through who they're sending to the NFL and the great running backs and offensive tackles, you would think Nick Saban is an offensive coach, but he's not. He's a defensive-minded coach first who's been willing to adapt to the modern age of college football, incorporate modern schemes, and embrace the explosive offense element of the game that is just taking the country by storm. And yeah, Chip Kelly was definitely a part of that with the Ducks back in the day. He was one of the first people to say, let's just not huddle and let's go really fast all the time. Now, a lot of teams do that because offenses over the course of history always innovate to get better, right? That's why in the NFL, Sean McVay has a coaching tree a mile wide in the league. It's insane. Anyone who's ever met with him or been on his staff will get a coaching job somewhere it's because he's really smart and he's a young, innovative guy who studies the game and wants it to evolve and has evolved it with the way he calls plays and the schemes he runs in the NFL. He's got an offensive coordinator in Seattle. He's got multiple head coaches over the league. A couple more just got hired from his staff this offseason. Like, it's insane, but that's the way that it works. And so when I watch this Kenny Dillingham offensive tape and what I think we should expect from his offense come 2022 and beyond with the ducks, there's a lot of schemes that a lot of other teams are running, right? Is, you know, you always hear in the NFL, it's a copycat league. Well, there's a reason because people want to do what is working for the other teams. Like, Oh, that works really well. That's really smart. We should figure out how to do that. Now I'm not predicting that Oregon just because they're running uh, a lot of the same plays that you see run by a number of teams across the country at a high level is, is going to have the magical season, the one we've all been waiting for, right? I'm not saying that that's necessarily what was holding us back, though I definitely take uh, schemes like these that, than what we had with Marcus Royal a few years ago. I was not a fan of how the play calling and offensive approach went in that offense. I, I hope we get rid of the pistol. I hope we're done with the pistol. Just unless you use it sparingly, okay. But as the base for your offense, not not a huge fan. I'm not saying that Oregon's going to have that season just because Dillingham does this sort of stuff with his approach on the offensive side of the ball. I'm not saying that Oregon won't. But what I am saying is when you're looking at football from a fan's perspective, you want your team to be up to date with the times. You want them to be modern and innovative and adaptive. It applies to NIL and the transfer portal too. You can't run away from it. Change is inevitable. You're either going to adapt or get left behind, right? What's the Billy Bean phrase for Moneyball? Adapt or die, Gary. <laughs> I mean, that Grady. It was Grady. Sorry, I butchered that. But yeah, that was a G name. I was close enough. That's what it is. Adapt or die. And so you see teams run a lot of the same concepts across the country. Everyone's got their own wrinkle on it, but... The, the fact that you see it all over the place is a good thing if your team is doing that too because it means they're not wanting to get left behind and they're seeing you know the, the way that the game is evolving, right? I mean, back in the day, nobody was doing it the way Chip Kelly was doing it, and then suddenly everybody was doing it that way. There is a reason. When you, you know, as my dad says, when you build a better mousetrap, everyone's going to want to get a piece of the pie. I mean, offenses always evolve to be better. 
right? They've only gotten better, more efficient, smarter, more clever, more creative, and more well-run and more productive as a result over the last 50 years in the game with football. It's the way thing work, things work. Same thing with technology, right? Blockbuster Video was a great product back in the day. It was fantastic. It worked really well. But what's better today? Netflix. If you're not streaming, then you are behind. You don't want to be an offense in college football that gets left behind. And other teams, a lot of them across the country, will introduce these RPO concepts. They'll have their own wrinkle on it. But the reason that they're there is because they're really hard to defend. I remember the first time I think Oregon saw them in a major way was in that crazy Arizona State game in 2015, at least that I can remember. I mean, there have been other teams that have done it, you know, after the Ducks started doing it a lot. But Arizona State was running it at the time. Todd Graham, I think, was their head coach. The way that teams do it a lot today, where they put the ball in the belly of the running back, and then they have a backside slant, and they're reading the linebackers, and Oregon couldn't stop them. They could not stop them, but that's the reason that I'm encouraged by what I've seen. First-time play caller, there's probably going to be some bumps in the road. It's not an easy thing to do. There's a difference between putting a game plan together and then identifying the defense and calling the right plays over the course of a game. I have no reason to think that Kenny Dillingham is incapable of that, but he hasn't done it yet. So that's you know the thought in the back of my mind about all of this. But from a scheme perspective, I like that he has a more modern approach. He's willing to do this sort of stuff because football is a copycat game and other teams are, are running these sorts of concepts because they work. So I think that's an encouraging thing for Oregon fans that that's going to be the approach. And I'm just excited for it all to, to get started and we'll keep following practice and reports. And that spring game should be very, very telling for what we should expect come the fall. Wrapping up today with another piece of uh, good news. Oregon women's golf is pretty fire. I know that's not where you thought I was going to go with this, but hear me out. They're ranked number two in the country. They've won two straight events. They've won three wins this season. They're most since the 1999-2000 campaign. They recently shot a four under 848 as a team, one shy of Northrop, of the Northrop Grumman tournament record. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. And we here on Locked On Ducks are celebrating wins for Oregon wherever we can find them. And we'll take them everywhere that we can get. I appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.